Hi, and Hi. welcome to today's interview with Guy Davidson about, you know, what's he up to, his talk, etc. cetera. Um, so Guy, um, this, what are you doing currently with C++? Well, I'm doing lots of things, actually. Um, so I'm in a new job. Uh, and uh, the, my, my employer's name is Six Impossible Things Before Breakfast. And one of the impossible things that we want to do is to make floating point arithmetic reproducible. Now, lots of people want this, but it's really quite hard to do. Uh, the reason why we want it in games is so that we can run simulations on different machines, on Xboxes and PlayStation 5s, for example, and get the same results on each machine so that they don't diverge. There's something very annoying, for example, um, about playing a racing game and then on your machine, you know, you're well out into the lead and you're about to secure a victory, whereas on everybody else's machine, you're not in the lead. In fact, you're in third or fourth place. And that's what happens when models diverge. Now, racing games are quite simple things. So they can do things like simply, you know, send the entire state of all the cars over the internet and everything's fine. But for more complex games, like, for example, strategy games like Total War and the things that I was making, um, that's just not an option. And so you have to run a simulation and keep it in sync on every agent. Now, that's quite easy to do at the moment if every agent is the same implementation. So, for example, if you're running only on Windows machines, on x86-64 processors, that can be done. We've been doing that, or rather Creative Assembly has been doing that for, for you know, a couple of decades. But unfortunately, floating point implementations vary from machine to machine, uh, from implementation to implementation, I mean. So, for example, on Clang, um, Clang loves using Fuse Multiply and Add, loves it. Great optimization opportunity. Uh, Visual Studio, MSVC, is rather more reluctant. And that means that you get different results because FMA will do one rounding, Whereas multiplying then adding will, will do two roundings and that will give you divergence and then boom, everything's gone. So what I decided to do was first of all, try and solve the problem locally. In fact, I didn't solve the problem. The team solved the problem locally. And now I have written a paper and I'm going to introduce it into the standard and we will have stable, reproducible floating point arithmetic and the world will be a brighter, happier, shinier place full of much more delighted engineers who will be able to write their code, knowing that it'll work wherever they want it to work, and everything everything will be great. It's all apple pie and and mom and home cooking and, and all the good things. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Sounds exciting. And I think like floating point is something you actually, you're going to give a talk about this on the conference, right? That's exactly what I'm doing. It's It's kind of a big focus of my life right now. And I'm looking forward to speaking at meeting C++ again. And I'm looking forward to telling everybody about this. Um, I actually proposed the talk before I had proposed the paper to the uh, to the C++ standard committee. Um, but since, since that paper's gone out, it's been well received. I think this talk's actually going to be um, probably one of the first times I'll talk about it publicly with feedback from the paper. Um, it's certainly it's a new talk for me. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to revealing all to everyone and taking questions and explaining to people why everything they know about floating point arithmetic is probably a little bit wrong. It's a surprisingly detailed um, space to be operating in. Uh, there are all sorts of nooks and crannies. Um, floating point arithmetic was standardized well, I say it was standardized. Yes, IEEE standardized floating point arithmetic first in 1985. And then they did another revision in 2008 um, and another revision in 2019. Um, and with each revision, you know, they've made things a little bit better. But C++, on the other hand, um, is not compliant with this standard. It references it, but um, it would be wrong to say that floats and double and long double are guaranteed necessarily compliant with IEEE 754. Uh, so that's one of the things we're going to be covering um, and why you need to think a bit carefully and look before you leap when you start you know, throwing floating point calculations around. 
That sounds interesting. What what can one expect when people come to your talk? What should they expect? Well, I've got a stack full of slides, certainly. I'll walk you through, you know, why we have floating point arithmetic, you know, what the alternatives are to um, you know, fixed point arithmetic is another solution. Um, why, you know, non-integral arithmetic is so complicated. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through IEEE 754. It's I actually think, I mean, you know, this could just be me with my standard spraying on, but I think that the standard is actually quite a good read. It's probably about four hours. If you get hold of a copy for the principally sum of about 200 Swiss francs, which is a bit steep, but there we are. Um, if you get hold of a copy and just read it through, it's about four hours and maybe, you know, a couple of glasses of wine. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's worth a read, but I can't possibly go into that kind of detail in one hour. So I shall spend, you know, 20 or 30 minutes making sure that, you know what the standard offers. Um, and then we'll look at some of the solutions that we tried at six impossible things before breakfast, and then we'll run through the paper. And that that should easily fill up an hour. I might be rushing towards the end of the moment, so I need to edit the, pre edit the uh, presentation a little bit right now. It's still a bit mm. too long. Okay. I think it's an interesting approach to try to standardize um, floating point numbers where every compiler basically right now is doing, I guess, like subtle things differently. And that's true. And um, one of the problems, I suppose, is that because C++ doesn't say anything at all, the standard doesn't say anything at all about. Um... So the real problem is float double and long double um, are implementation defined. The standard simply says these types exist, and all their operations are, are left up, up to the implementers to, to, to define. So there's no guarantees there. Um, there's all sorts of things they could do if they really wanted to. They could optimize across function calls, for example, and all sorts of nonsense. Um, and that would be a bit daft, but it would be standard. It would be standards compliant. Um, and you know the implementers have, have kind of run with that because different processes work in different ways. Um, optimization, for example, optimization flags are quite uh, well. They exist and they make things much faster, obviously. Um, but unfortunately, those optimization flags will work in different ways on different compilers. So you know you can try going through your code and 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 you know checking your optimization flags and your rounding modes and all of those things. But it's it's hard work. It's not very ergonomic. Um, so yes, I, by tightening things up a little bit, we can make life a little easier for the programmer. Although it's worth noting that those optimization flags, they are really good. If you turn all the optimizations off and, and try really hard to get perfectly you know, reproducible results on, on all your platforms, things do rather slow down. Uh, if you're going to choose reproducibility, uh, it comes at a cost of optimization and, you know, that's always been the way, you know, optimization cuts corners um, in some cases. And this is certainly a case where it cuts corners because, you know, what kind of precision do you really want? You know, your, your floating point numbers, you know, you, you, you've got on, on a double, you've got what, 54 bits of, no, 53 bits of precision. Um, that's, that's a lot of precision. You know, the universe is what, two to the power, Oh, God, it's 10 to the power 38 meters wide. It's, it's, it's very wide anyway, but you can, you know, completely represent it inside in, inside a, a, a double. You can represent the width of the universe in meters inside a double. So, you know, precision is extreme. Uh, but of course, you know, errors propagate. You know, if, if, and once errors propagate, then that precision suddenly becomes really quite valuable. Mm -hmm. Precision, correctness, and accuracy are words that I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be covering in a little more detail because they get thrown around in a rather confusing way. What about the hardware? I mean, it's like that some like something completely you can leave out on this. That can you can you standardize this completely on the software side? Well, I can only do any standardization on the software side, obviously. Um, clause eleven of the IEEE seven five four standard. Um, actually, I should probably call it six zero five five nine because what ISO does is it will take standards and it will import them into their own ecosystem uh, and and name them. Um, differently. So in the paper, I talk about 
ISO slash IEC 60559 colon 2020, which really rolls off the tongue. Um, but that is simply the latest version of IEEE 754 imported into the ISO ecosystem. And actually, there are some type traits in the uh, in the standard library called you know, is uh, is IEC underscore 559, uh, and that's comparing the extended floating point types um, for their uh, conformance to that standard. And that's where the 559 comes from, it's the last three digits of 60559. Um, but within clause 11 of that standard, which is devoted to reproducibility, which was quite the shock when I read it, uh, it says that reproducibility does require cooperation from the users and from the implementers and from the hardware folk. Uh, so, you know, I can I can write specification and say, this is how it should work. And the implementers, it's it's kind of up to you now to, to make it work and to negotiate with your hardware manufacturers to ensure that it does work. I'm optimistic, but then that's because we're fairly early in this journey. I've yet to have, mm -hmm. have you know, many, many knockbacks that usually come with the, as, as, a, as a proposal, you know, transitions through the entire process. So, do you have a proposal for the next committee meeting? Are you going to travel through Berlin to Rocklock? I absolutely do. So at Vlosvav, I'll be, sh I'll be uh, presenting revision one of the paper, which is P3375, if you go to wg21.link and uh, request P3375 you'll see the latest revision. The mailing came out yesterday. It's in there. Um, and it's it's going to be quite a laugh, I think, because, you know, everyone thinks they know about floating point, but, you know, there's always this, always the nooks and crannies. I'm still finding stuff out that I realised I had completely wrong. Um, there is considerable, there seems to be considerable um, enthusiasm within the committee, or certainly within the people I've spoken to, uh, for this proposal, because it's not just in games, but also in finance. Um, a, a, a use case that I, I was introduced to was where you write all your code on one platform, and then you write all your unit tests on another platform. So the unit tests might work on one platform, but they won't work on the other platform because the results are different. That's fantastically annoying. Um, and because they're working under all sorts of regulation and scrutiny, um, there's you know that that leads to all sorts of problematic uh, problematic situations. Uh, so I'm hoping, yeah, for us five, it'll be well received and uh, it'll get a good hearing, and I'll get lots of feedback because that's really what I need. If anybody out there feels like reading the paper and sending me feedback ahead of time, I am I am all ears. I am absolutely ready to receive it and to improve the paper because that's that's how these things work. The whole process, the whole standardisation process, works on feedback. And um, just making the papers better and better and better until people stop giving you feedback and everybody says, yep, that's fine. Let's put that in. And that's obviously the situation I want to get to. Yeah, I think in, in finance, you have a bit more to lose than just games. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons I got into games was because it doesn't matter. You know, if there's a bug in my code, then, you know, the game might crash or the game might not quite play, play properly and, and the player won't notice. Um, but if the game crashes, you simply restart. You might flame, you know, the tech support boards, but you just mm. restart the game, carry on playing, everything's fine. If I'm writing, I don't know, medical imaging software, you know, I don't want to be the person responsible for missing a tumour. Or if I'm writing, you know, nuclear reactor control software, you know, I don't want to be the person responsible for, you know, meltdowns and things like that. That would be very bad. That would sit badly on my conscience. Um, games, on the other hand, it's, you know, People tend not to, you know, people moan on the internet, but they tend not to commit you with flaming pitchforks outside your office demanding your head. Um, yeah, you actually talked about uh, your game programming career in the book you wrote with Kate Gregory. That's um, right. So do you also like go into floating point calculations in this book? Do you handle uh, this topic? So in that book, no, I don't. Um, so beautiful C++ was about the core guidelines. And although the core guidelines mm -hmm. do make some mention of um, you know, arithmetic, we decided not to cover those. Um, we took things that were a bit more immediate and a bit easier. But the floating point is quite subtle. You know, floating mm -hmm. point arithmetic is a subtle, it's a subtle problem. Um, I'm trying to write a function right now called isrepresentable. So if you have a value in one type, 
you know, you say, say you have 37 and you're in a unsigned int and you have a destination type, can that value be represented in the destination type? Um, it sounds like an easy function to write, but on the second day now, um, it's, it's surprising <laughs> how many errors I keep making. Fortunately, you know, extensive tests, extensive use cases, plenty of static asserts. Um, it's flushing these things out, but it's surprising how many corners I find myself running into. I don't think that's the correct phrase, but you know what I mean. You know, you, you reach corner yeah. cases and they defeat you, and you think, ah, oh, and then suddenly you've got another if statement in your code, and you think, oh, no, this is no good. And you've got this nasty, complex piece of spaghetti unfurling on your screen, <laughs> defying any kind of, you know, neatness. I completely understand, yeah. That's... Yeah. However, my next book, if I might plug it. Yeah, uh, sure. Great, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, right. I've been telling everybody I'm writing another book because then I'll start it. And if I tell everyone there's another book coming out, then I'll start writing it. And, you know, to be honest, I've got a table of contents. I kind of know what's going on. Uh, it's, the, it's titled, provisionally, it's titled The Game Developer's Guide to Learning C++. So it's not The Game Developer's Guide to C++, it's to learning C++ because, you know, with the best book in the world, a book on all of C++ would be a, a, a massive undertaking. I don't think Bjorn is going to write another edition of the C++ programming language. It's the standard is it's like two and a half thousand pages long now. Um, we're about to add reflection and contracts. Yeah. That's that's massive, really. You know, um, coroutines still, it's still really hard to teach coroutines. You know, lots of people give talks on coroutines and they kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of getting there, but I've yet to see a good talk where I come out the other end and thinking, that was a perfect explanation of coroutines. Um, maybe I'm not looking hard enough and I welcome all input in this regard, but when I have to teach people about coroutines, it's, it's, it's a, it's an uphill battle. Um, but yes, coroutines, floating point, all this. But I'll, I'll be teaching people how to learn um, and how to find resources and, and, and the kind of the broad concepts you need to think about, about state and execution, you know, what functions are, what function templates are, mm -hmm. you know, what abstraction is, what encapsulation is. Um, things that I actually did touch on in my first book, but I'm going to give them, you know, more voice. Because particularly, I want people... I started writing games in what 1980, um, mm -hmm. and it was there was nothing. There was no internet, you know. Well, there wasn't internet, but I didn't get it. You know, there was no World Wide Web. Um, everything was uh, published books. You know, it was just you know, watch out. What can I find at the library? And I lived in rural Cornwall, so the library was not exactly full of computing books. I can assure you. Um, and I only had to. It, it, it was really a case of. I think it was my maths teacher who said, oh, there's this magazine called Interface. I say magazine, it was more of a pamphlet. It was sort of 32 pages of, of A3 paper. So, no, 16 sheets of A, A3 paper folded in half, creating a 32 page magazine. And you'd, you'd write off to this bloke in, I don't know, Sheffield or somewhere like that. And you'd send him money and, and, and he'd send you back the latest issue of the magazine. And it would contain listings. You'd type the listings in and, and you'd write your software like that because, you know, the, that was the only way. And you'd copy, you'd copy this stuff onto your onto my little home computer there, onto my ZX81, my Spectrum, um, and then make games. And it was magical. The effort that you put in um, was considerable, but the result was extraordinary. Um, and along the way, I learned all about programming. And games are great for that. Games are great for teaching programming because it doesn't matter. You know, you're not gonna break your you're not gonna break your computer, you're not going to, you know, look, you know, accidentally deliver the launch codes to, to, to the nuclear stockpile or anything like that. You're just writing games, they're fun. There's a long history of this. Um, on the PDP-11, there was a game called Star, oh, Star, oh, I should know this. Uh, oh, this is awful. I'm going to have to look this up when I get back home. All right. But, but you know, there, there, there was a... It was a long time ago. There, yeah, it was the 1960s. Um, and... But this is a way that you would learn to write, you would learn programming was by writing games on the computers. You would, you know, games of strategy or card games or things like that, but just to keep yeah. an idea of flow and flow control and things like this. It's like, this, this is our program works, brilliant. And then you, you know, take what you've learned and abstract it elsewhere. If you use games to learn C++, I can teach you about, you know, state and function. I can teach you about all of these things. And, and I can say, right, let's write a little game. Let's write, you know, something like Rogue, but, 
you know, on the command line using the, you know, you, and without having to get into all the quite hard business of programming a GPU. You know, it's a lot to throw at somebody. You're just learning C++ and you're thinking, okay, that's a class and that's a struct. So a class is a well-behaved member of society and a struct is just a collection of data. Great, okay, GPU programming. It's, a, you know, there's a, there's a long gap between learning C++ and learning GPU programming. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep everything you know as simple as possible and C plus plus and equip people facilitates you know the, the the development of more interesting things. If you've got plenty of C plus plus under your belt, if you've, if you've written you know lots of code and you've kind of got the feel for it, then it's easier for you to learn all the other stuff. You know, it's I keep going back to state and execution because that's all there is. Things are either you know definitions are either objects or their functions. You know, it's state and it's execution. All these decorations like class and namespace and friend and public and things like that, they tell you about the code itself. But it's basically it's the functions and the data, the objects. That, that's that's what you need to worry about. And you can build everything up by abstraction. You know, you start with start with a motherboard and RAM and, a, and external storage and things like that, and, the, and 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 registers and you know, there's all your state. And then you can move over to functions. You say, right, here we are. We'll, we'll do some things this data. And then you go back to how do we represent this state? And they say, well, you know, we've got, you know, we have text that says, right, here's an integer. It's, you know, four bytes yeah. wide. So it's, you know, and you just, you, you just build it up. You, you, can, you, you, you hide the complexity each time and come up to, to a, a, a more simpler representation. Um, I've become quite excited about abstractions since writing the first book. And um, I, it seems like an interesting way of teaching because you can stop at any time and say, well, do you know what? I've so when is your book going to be, are you planning to uh, be done with the book next year or? I'm hoping to have it out for C++26. Um, mm -hmm. It's an ambitious undertaking because that means- Which I'm going standard to are you going, going to base it on? Well, yes. Well, that is the obvious question, isn't it? I've got to say, I'm probably going to start, I'm probably going to aim at C++23. And it's worth, it's worth bearing in mind, by the way, C++23 still isn't a published standard. You know, we finished. Yeah, we, we talked with that about Herb. Oh, we, did you? We did that right. quite recently, and Herb was like, it is, "It's supposed to be soon. It's yeah. supposed to be real soon." Now. Yeah. Um, but it but, took uh, a bit longer with editing this time. Yeah, the the drafting regulations are quite um, are quite particular. Um, but no, no doubt Herb was spoken more. I haven't watched Herb's AMA yet. So I'm really, really. I've been quite busy. I was in. Um, I was at C plus plus under the sea oh. last week. And, I, yeah. <laughs> all these things. I'm off to Zurich tomorrow to speak to address a meetup, and then I'm going to Poland. I'm going to Poznan to speak at the game industry conference there, game developer conference there, and then yeah. I'm going to Kortrijk in Belgium to go to, to, to attend Unwrap Kortrijk, and then I'm going, um, and then it's meeting C plus plus time, and then I'm off to Warsaw. Uh, so you know, know. All weeks. watching videos is a bit of a luxury at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the Amos trip was very interesting, but mm. I've also had time for it because I attended it as a moderator. So yeah. it was yeah. very interesting to see what he had to say and also I kind of you know, to listen to you today. Mm -hmm. Um so what else have you been up to like with the committee instead of just floating point? What is like the stuff you find interesting which is ongoing right now? Um I have to say I'm really focused on floating point right now. Um I'm finding the, the, the reflection discussion is fascinating. Um I think reflection is okay. going to be that that's the big feature you know people are excited about pattern matching and contracts and you know reasonably so they're interesting things but i think reflection is an, is an extraordinary game changer i think there are all sorts of things we can do with reflection you know we can you know i i believe we can do things like fix our abi problem using reflection you know we can identify our abi using reflection and maybe we can maybe we can start you know monkeying around with um making changes to abi i'm still kind of getting the hang of all this and looking into all of this um but you know, meta functions are an extraordinary thing. I don't know if you've spent much time looking at CPP2, at CPP front, at the, at, at, you know, the, the at Herb's, Herb's project. You know, he's already got meta functions in mm -hmm. there. Not but I think it's one of the more interesting and more practical approaches to, you know, having a C++ experimental language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the meta function usage in there is, it's, it, I, it makes life a lot easier. I remember when Herb, so the first time I actually met her was in 2017. I was going to go to Toronto uh, in the summer, 
uh, and present the graphics paper. That's how long ago it was. And um, Herb was giving the keynote at ACCU in uh, uh, in Bristol. And um, I met Herb the first time there. So it's just not seven and a half years ago. Um, and he spoke about meta functions, um, but as a proposal for C++ rather than, he hadn't really mentioned, he hadn't spoken about his own work on CPP2, on CPP front um, at that time. So this was just, look, here's a proposal, meta functions, look at this. We can define what, what, what structure should look like or what classes should look like, and then we can just specialize it further. And the excitement in the room was, was it was palpable. You know, there are lots of people I know who still vividly remember, vividly remember how they felt when they came out of that room, when they came out of that, uh, that keynote. Um, yeah. You know, so, so yeah, reflection is, I think reflection is, 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 that's the big ticket item for 26. I really hope we get it in. We're prioritizing it very highly in, in, in library evolution. Um, we're having extra library evolution working group meetings, online meetings, just so that we can go through everything and cover it all. Um, so, yeah, reflection's looking great. Um, I'd like I'd like an implementation to muck around with, and well, you know, I'd like time to actually muck around with an implementation and see what sort of things can be done. Besides, you know, enum to text or something because like that, that's the obvious first thing that people do. But you know, just serializing, serializing data, being able yeah. to say, right, I just want to serialize this class because that's so many bugs creep in there so many so many bugs lots of them um yeah it'd be nice to kind of get a machinery at least into the language where we can drive on reflection and also pattern matching and all those things yeah yeah pattern matching is going to be nice you know that's one of those really nice ease of use ergonomic features so rather than having to do complex switch statements and you know you, you can just pattern yeah anyway, yeah pattern matching is absolutely worth a look at Contracts as well, you know, making taking a cert out of the preprocessor and putting it into the compiler. Um, that's ah, for me, that's worth the price of admission alone. It seems that we're, you know, we're we're, we're pulling more and more stuff out of the preprocessor because you know, obviously we've taken modules out, so that's got rid of passion mm -hmm. notionally. <laughs> Over there, mm -hmm. somewhere in some time, we'll <laughs> we'll be rid of hashing clear. Um, and. Um, you know, we've got you know with with um, with contracts, then we, we kind of get rid of we, we get rid of a, of a server. We don't need the C assert header anymore. Um, yeah, you know it, it's the preprocessor is great. I'm aiming for twenty six, which which I'm still skeptical about if that all everything gets one hundred percent to I'm, be in the standard. Talk to Tima. Get Tima on. You know he's 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 co chairing. Oh, he's a, giving a talk about it. I know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's he's pretty confident. You know, there are lots of conflicting viewpoints, but you know, team is doing a great job. As is John Spicer of of, of mm -hmm. cats, and there are lots of people with you know strong opinions here. Um, and you know, it, it's I'm I, I'm pretty confident in team's yeah. ability. From from today's perspective, C plus plus twenty six is really taking shape to be one of the really great standards, which probably also then again has. Uh, like C plus plus twenty, probably even more like like more even than that was C plus plus twenty. Like the, the whole implementer issue that you just have, you know, mm. um, the reflection is implemented and contracts that wants to be implemented, yeah, and everything else. We it, it does take time, you know. I remember when C plus plus eleven came out, and it was about two thousand thirteen before it was implemented. Yeah. Use all the bit, use all the bits and pieces. You know, I, I was I was making um, I was making Rome Total War when um, Visual Studio 2010 came out, and that had mm. uh, and that had sort of partial support for C plus plus eleven. It had auto, um, and it had, but it didn't have generation of um, automatic generation of move functions of move constructors, which yeah. that was really problematic actually uh, because we were trying to use move and. Then when we went, moved over to a compiler that did automatically generate them, because we'd already declared them explicitly, we, we, we were getting in all sorts of trouble. Um, but this time around, you know, we, we've got three compilers now. We've got three, you know, the, 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 the majestic three that um, are, are competing. You know, they're, they're, they're all trying to, you know, be the best, obviously. Competition's great in this regard. You know, they're, they're, they're keen to be the, one to, the ones to... Say right first. I've got all the features in. I've got all the library in, um, and that's just great for us consumers. 
you know, for the users. Um, we're, you know, we're benefiting from this competition. I don't know how long it's going to take to get all the bits and pieces in, but um, you know, I know that um, I know that people are working on it right now. They're working on twenty six features. You know, we've already voted in plenty of twenty six features into the working draft. And yeah. Things can come out again. Look at contracts. That was supposed to go into twenty. Um, mm. You know, and that was pulled out at the last minute, and quite dramatically so. Um, but I know, remember concepts in C plus plus seventeen. And I'm being really upset that it didn't make it, that mm. the train left the station without it. Well, yeah, the train model is great until people are trying to cram things. Oh, I want to catch this train. I don't want to wait for the next train. You're thinking, patience, patience. These, you know, get it right. Don't get it early. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's an important thing. That's why contracts got yanked. They weren't right. But, you know, reflection, we've been working on reflection for ever I, I i don't know when the first papers come I mean, it must be over 20 years now that we've been looking at reflection you know meta programming template meta programming that's been around for about 30 years now and it's about time that we can sign template meta programming to the bin and we, <laughs> have we actually got proper reflection um proper compile time programming uh, that's the uh you know it, it's you know the language is you know i look at rust rust is lovely you know, the tooling is fantastic. It's a great ecosystem. It's, but you know, they, they've learned from lots of mistakes that we've made. Um, but you know, we're also learning from Rust. You know, we're looking at, you know, I, I'm sure all the people in the tooling group, in the tooling study group are looking at, are, are looking jealously. Yeah, I think it's a lot Rust. easier when you just have one implementation and yeah. also Rust will, will have its issues once it's ages. Well, this is the thing. I mean, Rust is so you know, they're, they're so young and people we'll start branching and bifurcating, okay. and, and you know, that I, 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 I have no idea what's going to happen to Rust. I absolutely do wish you the best because it's it's great. It's making it's 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 making a difference, and also you know, it's putting it's it's giving us a kick about memory safety. You know, Rust, the Rust Borrow Checker is you know an excellent excellent piece of kit, and uh, you know we do have. Proposals, uh, you know, underway. Uh, you know, Sean Baxter's borrow checker in Circle yeah. is, uh, is ideal. You know, it, look, it looks it looks good to me. We have encouraged further work, and we're very good at that in the committee. We're very good at saying yes, please do more work. Let's have a vote. Who, who'd like this person to do more work? Yes, yeah, brilliant. Okay, you know, that's that's kind of what it looks like. It's very I, easy to, to as do. someone from the games industry. I think I you know have to ask you how is it in the low level programming is there space for something like that running in the background i don't know um i think the larger problem is that everyone in the games industry uh, uh, are c and c sharp programmers there's quite a large number of c sharp programmers in the games industry adding another language i think is you, you need a really strong reason to do that because now you've got to you've got to employ people who know both if you hire like Five or six people, and they say, "Hey, yeah, we can do all. We can do all of this gameplay in Rust," and then they all go away. You've got to hire Rust programmers, or you've got to get your mm -hmm. C++ programmers to, to 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 sort it all out. Um, and that's a that's a big risk, you know. Um, so I would I would be very cagey about um, you know migrating people to Rust, or even migrating you know, or even starting starting afresh with Rust because the I think the practitioners are thin on the ground. There are more C++ programs out there, so it's an easier hire. I but think. I think Rust, you know, I think Rust, really Rust, to change. yeah, Rust is a nicer programming environment, but I think by the time we get enough Rust programmers, I would hope, you know, for it to be feasible to make a difference, I would hope that C++ would have caught up. You know, tooling is, I think, the silver bullet. But the trouble is, all that we standardize is, we, we don't even have a definition of a source file you know, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't know what a linker is. We don't define these things. We just say, look, it's a compiler. We're standardizing compiler. Just, just stop. We're stopping at compiler. Just leave us. You know, that's quite hard. You know, branching out into all of the other stuff. That's that, that's a big, a significant undertaking. But you know, I think we are going to have to do it. You know, ultimately, you know, Rust will eat our lunch if we just stand still. You know, yeah, all, yeah. The, the efforts which are done to to implement this into C plus plus and yeah. to see 
um, that we have a new generation of leadership and interesting languages. Yeah, absolutely. Pushing us but, along. I mean, you know, Python, we know this, it's not the only place where we're having our lunch eaten. Python and NumPy uh, are, are, you know, that's just everyone's go to kit now. If you want to do anything, anything numerical, you crank up Python and do NumPy, you know. Yeah, we call it AI space. Yeah, exactly. But that, what, what a loss. We've got people, you know, doing linear algebra in Python. And I'm thinking, oh, the, the wasted watts, really. You know, <laughs> the, the extra energy that's 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 consuming. One of the reasons, so, you know, I have a linear algebra proposal sort of on the go. It's it's kind of on pause at the moment whilst I get this floating point stuff done. But uh, one of the reasons I wanted to standardize linear algebra was just to provide more reason for people to stick with C++ for their numerical needs. Um, but there's, you know, there's there's all sorts of there's all sorts of things we could do to, you know, make C plus plus more usable, a simpler to use, but b, you know, with a broader with a broader library. There are some people who say no, no, the library should be as small as possible. We should not standardize anything in the library. We should we should stop stop right here unless it can't be done in the language. We should stop here. But the trouble with that is that, you know, you're 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 then competing with big standard libraries. Like, you know the the, yeah. the C sharp standard library is absolutely enormous. It's fabulously well. It is a it is a treasure trove of of, of useful things that you don't need to write. Whereas right now in C plus plus you can't open a socket securely as a standard. You can't just say, "All right, I like to open a socket." That type. You can't do that. You've got you've got to get right. a third party library. Yeah, it's, it's frameworks for that. Uh, yeah, like a whole lot, a whole landscape of libraries which allows you that. Yeah, and, and, and are they interoperable? And you see the ISO process, and we talk about safety, and I think that's like also something we we touch with help on us. Um, just networking is not going to be in 26 because we are just bringing uh, executors and schedulers into 26, and we depend yeah, exactly. on them. Yeah, and I haven't even spoken about executors. You know, <laughs> don't know how to you know ship like when you have an like the the networking proposal that has like a, some severe error which is exploited and we need to fix the language mm. uh, how do you ship something like that and I think yeah. that's um, for me and, and a certain thing it's time to see that certain parts of the C++ standard shouldn't be directly in the ISO standard that we should have uh, a gathering an official gathering of libraries and experiences for the standard before we standardize things because i've talked with nico and you know nico is not so uh, much fond with the rangers proposal because there are some issues he sees and other people say well there's not so much of an open issue because we think that things should be done this way and it's teachable um I'd, and, certainly like, I'd certainly like to find somewhere to put tristan brindle's flux library you know that that's that's a really good piece of work that Tristan's done now. It's 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 yes, really yes. impressive stuff. And and I know what you're saying. We do need some kind of blessed repository of of, mm -hmm. of libraries. The trouble with that though is that is is the is the maintenance. It's, you know this this is what happened with Boost. You know Boost was meant to exactly. be an excellent collection of libraries, but you know that nobody was being paid to maintain them. You know people, a lot of the stuff was maintained. Um, you know by, you know by the authors. But after a while, they, you know, they they lose interest, or they they pass in some cases. They they mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're no longer with us, and it, unless somebody else picks up the baton, then you know the code rots. You know, one of the things about proposing something into the standards is you're delegating that maintenance to the implementers, and you know, without that without that maintenance, thing you know things fall apart. You know. As as you know, we're, 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 software engineering runs on open source. You know, you've all seen the the XKCD cartoon of the chap in Nebraska with a little, yeah. you yeah. know, left pad. We all remember left pad. You know, that, that's that's what happens. Um, these people aren't being paid, and obviously, I think they should be, but I'm not going to. But I think somebody should, somebody else should should pay these people. But and but we're all thinking like that. You know, I've I've got you know I'm I'm throwing money at several people on Patreon. But I can't cover everyone, not meaningfully yeah. and reasonably. Um, I don't know how we solve the open source problem, and but we and I think we've got to solve that to solve the um, to solve the library problem. Now, regarding the network libraries, it, it, the, the the network 
TS has been around for, again, that's over 20 years as well. Mm -hmm. I wonder, maybe it's too big. Maybe you actually need to start at the bottom and say, all right, let's standardize socket. You know, yeah. and, then, and then and then and then work up rather than trying to put the whole thing thing in. But I'm not a network programmer, well, not that, not yeah. that level anyway. You know. But I think with networking again, it's like we we have good stacks available. I'm using Qt, and Qt is, is mm. perfect for it. Boost has Beast, and is building on that the whole ecosystem with Azure, which has been around for ages. Mm. Um, and I kind of understand that we don't standardize networking already, but it's like we should have something which makes easy things available, just like, you know, querying a socket or something like that. It's the batteries included thing. And then adding on that. Yeah. You know, what, what can you do out of the box before you have to start worrying about importing other libraries and then worrying about configuration files and builds for and CMake and, you know. Application I'm, managers. <sighs> a whole other world. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm looking forward to see you. And I think you speak on the first day. So four weeks, we get to listen to your talk. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm so pleased to be returning to Berlin. I love Berlin. And uh, and it's good to see everyone there. It's good to see the crowd because it's just, oh, it's such a great conference. I've been coming since, what, 2014, I think? 2015 was my first. And it's just yeah, been, it's yeah. It's, 10 it's, years now in Berlin. Sorry? 10 years in Berlin, 2014 to 2024. Yes, yes, yeah. That's but that sounds about right. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the conference. I love the hotel. I'm really pleased to be going there. It's uh, it's the highlight of my it's the highlight of my winter certainly. Better than Christmas. <laughs> well, we'll see. Happy to see you there. And I guess with that we enter we end the interview. Thank you for your time, guy. You're Happy very welcome.